Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Narrows podcast. As always, I'm joined by my good friend Timmy Long. Hi hey everyone. Um, Rowan is on the decks and this week we have um, Anla, isn't it? Anla. Uh, he's from Belfast. You have uh, Jim in Cork and you're an interesting character. Um, and uh, I know you're a true mutual friend. Um, and he's been on to me for months. He was saying, if you're friendly, boy, he's fucking, you know, you, you love him, he's interesting, mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. So um, I'm delighted to get John eventually. Um, for the people that don't know you, who are you and where are you from? It's good to be here anyway, first of all. And thanks for the invitation to come down. So I have actually been living in Cork for the last 10 or 11 years now. And um, I'm originally from Belfast. I suppose I moved to Cork originally in 2010. Me and one of my brothers were actually playing for the Piercy. Up in the north side. Oh, That's yeah. my yeah. small place club. Yeah. Hey, hey, go on the Piercy. <laughs> Good call out. <laughs> and then um, I set up a gym called Ackley, which has been on the go for eight years now. This will be eight, eight, its eighth year. And Where's that? It's just across from St. Sinf- Finbar's Cathedral. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I suppose like the, the things I've been involved in the last year or two, mostly been like doing our own podcast, Rebel Matters. And actually, this time last year, I was in Palestine. Uh, we set up a a community gym in a refugee camp there and I suppose that's the the world winter I will get to that mm. what was it like growing up in Belfast you were born in 85 like myself I was born in 85 my mom is actually from Dublin so she moved to Belfast in 1984 which would have been a time when most people were trying to get out of Belfast yeah. unless they actually had to be there so uh, I suppose it was mad enough time in, in history like you know mm. um like, I, I was born in Belfast, and we moved into the Armour Road. We didn't have an awful lot in the way of material possessions or money. Yeah. Like, I was actually talking to my mum one day, and she told me that when they brought me back from the hospital, they had to pull a drawer out from the kitchen, yeah. hanging just that that's where I was sleeping for the first yeah. while. But we lived on the Armour Road when I, when I was a kid for a couple of years, which uh, was kind of in the news recently because of the PSNI attacking the, yeah, the, uh, m- yeah. the memorial that was there yeah. for the people who were killed in the Sean mm-hmm. Graham Boogies. Which and that, that was controversial because it was contrasted against other um, memorials um, where there was no police pre- presence or the, maybe the, the, the loyalist um, march. The big the big contrast was that there was a UVF show of strength in Belfast and the cops were just standing watching it. Mm. And they actually arrested at the Sean Graham Memorial, ar- arrested one of the sur- survivors who was shot, uh, Mark Sykes. That's mad, isn't it? It's mad because, like... You'd like to think that that we've all, that that things have moved on and progressed, but there's still an undercurrent of sectarianism and political policing going on in Belfast. Uh, mm. Like there's still a very strong thread of the RUC in the PSNI, mm. and things like that just make it uh, kind of kind of bring it back to the surface and make it more obvious. Yeah. I can imagine when you were growing up, um, you didn't really trust the police or the RUC at the time. You see, whenever I seen that footage of the what happened on the Armour Road the other week, I was raging, and I was in Cork. I was just, I've just, I'm just back from Belfast after two weeks up there now. Um, but I was raging when I seen that because it just brings everything back to the surface, you know. What happened then? So, thirty years ago, there was a, a loyalist, two loyalist gunmen within the a bookmakers on the Armour Road and opened fire on the people who were inside, and um, like it was a complete massacre, and. That was the 30 year anniversary for that there was okay. a couple of weeks ago so the relatives like within the covid guidelines just went and were just laying a couple of wreaths at the mm-hmm. at the bookmaker shop and the cops came and attacked the memorial ended up arresting one of the survivors and that's a massive throwback to the kind of stuff that, that would have been happening when, whenever we were kids mm-hmm. and uh, so, you know, sometimes i'm kind of hesitant to talk about that time because of the fact that there was people who through who went through that period of time went through a lot more traumatic things than personally that I did or that mm. uh, people people in my immediate family did. But at the same time, it was kind of a, a, an element of like community trauma and things that I didn't even know were unusual at the time were happening. Like I didn't know until I was 18 that we were living through this this mad time where like it was unusual to go out and throw stones at the cops or it was unusual to wake up in the morning and have your street full of soldiers in full combat gear. Mm. And some of my really early memories uh, in Belfast were things that were connected to the conflict, like being at people's funerals or mm. uh, like I remember one time that uh, I answered the door in the morning before we were going to school and there was the cop, the street was full of cops and the army as well who would travel with them and the cop at the door was drunk and he pulled out his pistol 
I said at 8 o'clock in the morning before we went to school, they were coming to try and take mm-hmm. our dad away, like for a parking ticket or something, stupid like that, like a couple of parking tickets or whatever. But that's the kind of thing that was going on for intimidation purposes. Mm-hmm. And they came into the house and all, and went up and our youngest brother, Nisha, was lying on the bed upstairs just after getting out of the bath. And that's why eventually they didn't take him. Like, but I, I'm not kind of saying that to like, make out like a big exaggerated story or anything. Just that was just pain, the kind of thing that was pain, happening yeah, on the day to day. And pe- People yeah. got it a lot worse than that. Yeah. But I think mm. what your you the, the picture you painted there is the picture that I would have seen on the news growing up, you know, in Belfast and Northern Ireland at the time. Um protests, riots, young people mm. throwing stones at orange men walking through their their estates and stuff like that. And for somebody from the south, mm. like it's we're, we share the same island, but we're so disconnected in many yeah. ways. It was like the Northern Ireland is on this new segment. Next, we're going to go to the Middle East, and it's just another new segment for. I, like, it's very hard for us to comprehend what it's like living in that environment. You know, it, um, the, the way, violence. Yeah, it's cr- like I I have only seen clips on the television as well, and and articles from papers and books and stuff. You know, um, but what I really gather, there's a hatred between the two sides you know it's just that they just don't like each other so much you know it's it's i don't think it's it's pretty much like um the israelis in palestine as well you know it's just you're on one side or or you're on the other Mm. you know will that ever change the thing is about people's perception about what happened in ireland and what's happening still and what's happening in Mm. in palestine and other places around the world where there's uh essentially colonization going on is that one of the one of the main things that the oppressing side the oppressor will do will try and make it so that it's a conflict between two local war infections who just don't like each other and that's the way the conflict in the north was portrayed like we were going through a military occupation and a war Mm. in this country but if you just looked at rt news that was one of the main kind of outlets that was censoring what was going on massively like people from the Republican movement weren't even allowed to talk on RT News. That's right, there was yeah. an actor and like um the the thing that they wanted to portray and that the, that the free state government in the south wanted to portray was that Catholics and Protestants just don't get along with each other. But on the street that's not the way it was. You know, you mentioned like that mm. there, there's hatred. Our hatred was for the army and for the security personnel that were coming to our front doors that were break going into people's mm. houses in the middle of the night and arresting them that were killing people on the, just killing innocent people like there's a 12 year old girl was shot dead by a plastic bullet just up road from our house two of them um julia julia Judy livingstone and caroline kelly yeah like so we i never had any hatred for anyone because mm. of their religion but see if you have a, a soldier from a different country walking mm. down your street that's different like that's not mm. that's not people normal people are going about their day-to-day lives just hating on each other because generally speaking uh, like people don't hate each other mm-hmm. no like uh jewish people don't hate muslims and muslims don't hate jewish people but it's right to be angry against zionism mm-hmm. in palestine which is more of like a political and an economic project to steal more palestinian mm-hmm. land in a way that in ireland what we had was uh a me- uh, a group of people who wanted to hold all of the power and like take and, and at, the, at the expense of, of a section of the community and that just happened to be that the section of the community that were being oppressed and that were being denied their uh, civil rights were the people from uh, work, like mostly working class Catholic areas. Yeah. And down, and, d- down through history there's been plenty of Protestants fought for Irish freedom. And this sectarian conflict is probably relatively recent in the context mm. of an 800 year occupation. When you think about the United Irishmen and Wolf Tone, and you know, there's been Protestants as far to get um, to overthrow the British occupation, too. Mm. You know, Look, when you scratch the, thir- the surface a wee bit, you'll see that it's, it's, it's never been like Catholics against Protestants, it's been a fight against injustice and against um, so oppression and mm. occupation. People just want to be able to live a life that where they have uh, equal opportunities and that mm. and that you can live safely and freely and enjoy your time on life. Yeah. Ultimately, like and a lot of the people who ended up taking part in the armed struggle were people who wouldn't have had anything got to do with an armed struggle only for the fact that someone belonged to him was killed or something like that. Even yeah, like um, that 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 was kind of like the last resort in many ways. Like yeah. you know. Mm. 
But I watched the documentary a few years ago. Mm. I was on Bally Murphy. I know nothing about Bally Murphy until I think it was Channel, Channel 4 um, published a documentary. Bally Murphy is like a house in the state. Mm. Correct me now if I'm wrong anywhere. It's like a house in the state where the British Army came in after something protest or some match but they were up on top of the roofs of the houses shooting innocent people what, trying to go on home and stuff like that so see i was actually in balmurphy last week because i was up visiting spring hill community house which was a house that father des wilson who served the people of balmurphy his whole life um set up in um the it must have been in the early 70s or something that they set the house up originally but uh the people, well, in 1971, the British Army opened fire on civilians that were walking around, walking around Balmurphy and people who were going to help injured people. And it was the Parachute Regiment who did it. And there was no if, like proper uh, inquiry into what happened. Nobody was prosecuted for it. And then the year after that, 1972, is uh, when the Blood, Bloody Sunday Massacre happened. Mm-hmm. The same regiment of the British Army. So if, if something had been done about the Balmurphy Massacre, then there's every possibility that yeah. we wouldn't have had to go, go through mm. the Bloody Sunday uh, massacre as well. Mm. And, I mean, Bloody Sunday it, it kind of epitomises the British state's approach to what was happening in Ireland because what they basically did in Bloody Sunday was killed, along with the 14 people that they killed, they basically killed the civil rights movement yeah. in Ireland, which was a peaceful movement that was fighting for e- equality in terms of housing and mm, uh, one man, one rights. vote. And then that a lot of people seen that as just like, that's the end of the civil rights movement now. And then the IRA got, was people queuing up round the block to get into the IRA the day yeah. after Bloody Sunday? Yeah, I can yeah, imagine. I suppose if, like if you're living in a community and, and something like that happens, your and your neighbors, your friends, your family members are after being killed and shot and injured you know, especially if there's a little bit of anger within you, within you already over the situation, you are going to, to join. Fight back, like. You are going to fight back. It's it's an, it's, a, it's a human instinct to fight back when yeah. you're being attacked. It's very hard to put yourself in a position uh, of saying what you would do unless that that circumstance actually comes yeah. about, and you have to make the decision. And uh, I think that what's important is that as we're looking back at the things that happened. That is that um, not not to kind of look back with rose tinted glasses and be like, oh, nobody should have joined the IRA. Nobody, there shouldn't have been a fight. I was all everyone should have just been marching or just like just went to the government and said we de- we deserve equal rights and being peaceful and stuff like that. There because looking back, it, it's different than mm-hmm. what it was at the time. You know what I mean? And you'll you'll see that like that's wholesale the way that happens in in the government of twenty six counties anytime. Uh, Sinn Féin seem to be getting a bit of a lead in the polls. Leo Varadkar or uh, Michal Martin will come out and they'll say, mm. oh, I mean, you should be apologising for, for the IRA and all. Yeah. And, and every single time without it's fail. It's just, and it's, it's a pity because uh, Michal Martin came out there a couple of weeks ago and said that uh, Sinn Féin need to apologise for, for uh, their connection with the IRA and actually brought up uh, the murder of Pat Finucane as one of the things that he was kind of trying to make out that he was he was, he was championing. Mm. And it, personally, I think it's it's an absolute disgrace that he, they keep doing that because, like, me, me, Fine, Gael, Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil haven't ever done anything serious to help uh, bring justice or no. uh, truth to people who were victims of British state violence in Ireland. And to do it for their own political gain, to try and Not keep... Yeah, yeah. This, to try and basically um, keep people afraid of the only real alternative to their type of politics in the free state yeah. is it's it's very disrespectful yeah. and it's it's a joke but like it's not going to uh, stop no. at any time because like it, that goes back to it's just reinforcing the kind of misunderstanding that a lot of people in the 26 counties have had about what happened in Ireland because of the censorship of the of RT the censorship that RT yeah. were doing and because uh, it suited the Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil to reinforce that narrative about Catholics and Protestants just not not, not liking each other because they're just the, want to keep hold of power down here mm. and are f- afraid to ruffle too many feathers in Westminster and in many ways like we mentioned Palestine and uh, earlier on in many ways the government of the free state in the form of Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil are complicit in some way in my eyes 
with what's happening in Palestine as well because they're absolutely terrified of upsetting America too much or upsetting Israel mm-hmm. too much. So they just won't speak out. Mm-hmm. Simon Coveney like would shit himself if he had to speak out against Israel uh, sh- str- strong enough mm-hmm. because of the economic interests that lie in being connected with America and I suppose being connected some way with, with Israel as well because mm-hmm. of the American and Israeli um, connection. We have a seat in the UN Security Council, don't we? Yep. Uh, is Dan Simon Coveney has been put under pressure to make a stand against the situation in Israel and Palestine, but he just doesn't seem to have the battle to do it, I don't think. One thing, the government had a very good opportunity to bring in a, a complete ban on all settlement products coming into Ireland. Mm-hmm. And uh, like that was ready to go and, and they pulled back on it. Like. Yeah. So Ireland has an opportunity to be... Uh, a leader because like we have a very strong connection with what with like when you're over in Palestine yeah. and they they hear you're Irish they have a sense of affinity yeah. with you because they know that we've come through quite a similar political co- conflict but like the, the connection is with the people it's not with the it's not with people yeah. who in the government who yeah. aren't who are afraid to stand up for them because the people in Ireland like are and are always willing to stand up for mm-hmm. injustice around the world mm-hmm. because of the fact that we've experienced it whether it's in the last. Uh, 50 odd years in the north or whether it's you're thinking a little bit further back d- yeah. down here in the south yeah. we've come through it you know yeah. so uh people in ireland are always willing to stand up uh when there's cases of injustice but the problem is that uh we're living in a time where the prophet is king yeah yeah and yeah. then that's what stops them stops yeah. governments from like standing up and speaking yeah. out about uh, oppression or injustice or yeah. doing something serious about it instead of just like kind of paying lip service to it. Can I ask you your perspective on something that I've been thinking about for a long time <laughs> and I'm glad now we can speak to somebody of my generation from Belfast. We're the rebel county, as you know. We celebrate uh, when we put your black and tans, we celebrate little skirmishes that we win, kill Michael and whatever, right? And we'll lay reeds and, you know, we'll have documentaries on Nationwide about all that, right? But when there's a conflict in the north, for your freedom um and if there's anything around celebrating that that's demonized do you, how does it feel or what do people in the north think of us when we we're allowed to celebrate our victories when we're fighting for our freedom but if you if you do it you're a terrorist and that's a crime and you go to prison is there a bit of a what, what's your opinion on that actually first mm-hmm. the it's funny, actually, I seen something mentioned on social media there yesterday. It was some guy to do with Leo Varadkar having a portrait of Michael Collins up above the fireplace in, yeah. in the dial. And it was something along the lines of, it was when he was leaving and Michael Martin was taking over his T-shirt and I was like, oh, we'll get this picture back up in the wall again sometime soon. And no, that, that really highlights the ho- hypocrisy yeah. that exists on a governmental level. But it, I think that's probably a different thing than what you're that, what you're saying. Like, you know, um, commemorating... Uh, people who lost their lives for the fight for Irish freedom uh, is, is, do you know, like, if you do it down here and you're doing it for something that happens, like, there was a big uh, anniversary there last week with, with an ambush that the uh, West Cork IRA attacked the Black and Tans just outside Balavorny and uh, had ended up with a big six-hour gun battle with them. And there's actually a monument just as, you, as, as you're coming into Balavorny there and it's kind of on a dangerous spot in the road so it's, it's never a safe place to stop yeah. and it was just interesting to see that, did that come up last week and I read all about it but um, so I think the thing to consider is that if people are coming out against uh, commemorations of the recent conflict whether or not they're just doing that for political gain because a lot of the time it is for political gain mm. uh, and the resistance from it comes from either Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael and um, I mean like re- recently enough, we had the Kill Michael, right? The Kill Michael commemoration. Around the same time, there was a commemoration for, I think it was around the Mountbatten anniversary and what happened there afterwards. And I was just, as somebody that's not from the North and that has a kind of a fleeting interest in history, I've been interested in history, I know it probably a little bit more than the average person, but I was always taken by, we can commemorate the our defeats of the mm-hmm. Black and Tans here, but the boys up in the north can't commemorate anything and they're fucking blasted, you know? Yeah. And how do they actually feel? Do they look at us and think, who the, f- who the fuck are they? They, they? they have their freedom now, so we must fucking shut up and put up up here, you know? That's what I'd probably put myself in their shoes, you know? <laughs> Personally speaking, whenever we were growing up, we had, uh, there was 
no trust with the security services. Obviously, we had a lot of animosity towards the British uh, government and the British Army and the RUC, and especially the loyalist, loyalist paramilitaries who came out on countless occasions and saying that if you were Catholic, then you were a legitimate target mm. to be killed and killed countless mm. people. So you see, looking back now, the war is over in Ireland. And the first thing is that anyone who lost their lives should be remembered and commemorated no matter what says that, mm. that, that they were fighting off or they were, whether they were innocent, because at the end of the day, everyone who lost their lives had a family and um, people that loved them. But for us, uh, coming from a, a Republican kind of area that for what we've seen was probably different from the way that we were being perceived in the South. Like we just felt that, that um, we, like the IRA came from the fact that after 1969 when Bombay Street was burnt down then the IRA came to defend the nationalist areas and that they were fighting against a British occupation that was you know, like unjust in mm. the first place. So, the, I mean, I think it's right to commemorate the yeah. things of across course, the board. Like, course, I, you, I agree with you. Do you feel a little, a little bit let down by, by the, like, or abandoned the Republic side because, yeah, or abandoned because, oh, she, we have we have fr freedom in twenty six counties. We're up here and we still have a struggle. You know, did you ever like? And this is a really uh, legit question. Like, do people feel a little bit let down? Like because we got the 26 counties down here and then all of a sudden oh, we, you were left on your own. Does, does I think that make when, sense Whenever you? we were kids, like whenever yeah. I was a kid, I felt abandoned by the South for sure. Yeah. And, and I felt a certain level of animosity towards the Free State Army yeah. and towards the Garda Shekana and towards the Free State Government. And for us, it was like, like exactly yeah. what you're saying but I mean because I would I would yeah. and that's that's the truth I'd, I'd feel let down it's, it's a natural you know? emotion to have yeah. and that's but that true. animosity doesn't come across them when you're talking to people you know, like regular people mm -hmm. the way that we're talking now like I'm not like fuck are you guys fucking know, left yeah, us for yeah, shit yeah, like yeah. what are you but <laughs> you know, like, I think the important thing is to try and uh, to try and understand what was yeah. happening and that's like again to bring it back to Palestine as a visitor going to Palestine it's not my job to go in and try and fix everything or like mm. try and like tell them what to do. For me, the important thing going to Palestine is listening to people talking, getting an understanding of what their perspective is and hearing their views. And in terms of people in the South who might have only been reliant on the mainstream media mm. for their information about what was, what was happening in the North, mm. the important thing is more so just to go and learn about it. You know, go to Belfast, get a political tour from someone, uh, like understand. one of my friends, Belfast, Podrick McCotter, who I did a podcast with on the Rebel Matters, is a tour guide, does political walking tours up there. And there's no better way to get to know what was happening up there than just going up and just talking to people. Mm -hmm. And um, not like getting off the tourist path. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Titanic Centre and all in Belfast is good, but like... Yeah. And when, I, when people are going to Belfast, I recommend to go and do a walking tour instead. I'd love yeah. that. And, and I definitely talk. will do that. I'm, I'm mad to go up there and to yeah. just have a look. At and we have a couple of guests lined up. In, mm. I've never been in the north. Me no, neither. I've never been in Galway mm. or in the west either. I've Leinster and Munster type of a man, you know. But <laughs> a fucking hell, I want to go to the north. And um, there's so many people up there I want to have on the podcast. You know, there's so much mm. history and culture and so many stories. Mm. Um, so when we can, we'll do it. Yeah. You know? right. There's a big connection between Cork and Belfast, like, and, yeah. uh, and not just not just because of being being the rebel county and all. There's actually uh, I was up at it there a couple of months ago. There's a, a grave it just has a small wee cross on it in Milltown Cemetery, which is the main cemetery in West Belfast. And there's a woman um, who died in 1947 buried there. She was from Cork, and she went to Belfast and worked in a workhouse. Died there, so she must have somehow made her way to Belfast, which mm. would have been difficult enough. Yeah, I know, like in the 1940s, mm. and then stayed Jeez. there and died in workhouse, and she's buried there. Mm. Yeah, there is yeah, definitely a massive connection, you know. And and, and even listening to there, I see a little bit of a, a similarity to your kind of ways with, with us down here as yeah. well. You know, but, um, do you know what's another interesting thing, that, or another, in, um, another question that I think is interesting? Um, Let's say if you have two sides that are a conflict, right? Um, you and your group of friends and go over the wall or whatever, the other state, they, they don't know there's animosity there, but you share a city. And I'm trying to put, I just try and think if, if, I, if Cork was Belfast, right? And you have the north side and the south side, and on the north side you have nationalists, and on the south side you have loyalists. 
but you share the city center and you share the public offices the hospitals mm. the social welfare offices the you know yeah. like is there like a truce in the city center or do you have to be careful or, or how is does that split? work or is it is it is it is city have hall two, divided do you have two of each <laughs> see in belfast <laughs> it's not even like north side and south side if I can maybe draw this in, in the context of the North Side, see if I lived in Firhill, yeah. like they say that's where we live in Belfast, it's like I couldn't ever go up to Knocknahini, <laughs> like because there's a wall down the middle. Yeah. And that's the way it yeah. was in many respects. Like now, I remember looking out the window, my, my bedroom, and there's a good kind of view of Belfast and just been like, you're like half the, half the teenage girls who are the same age as me at the time. Or on the other side of that wall, I'm never going to get to hang out with him. <laughs> like, there's something definitely wrong there. And at the time, whenever we were, when we were teenagers in school you and stuff. Out, and, uh, <laughs> you missed out, You missed out. See, whenever I, we were going to town, when we started being allowed to go to town, when we were about 14 or 15 after school, we'd have to bring a change, change of clothes, so we'd have to take our uniform off, because it, it was kind of dangerous at the time to go down with like we were at an Irish speaking school so our uniform was quite distinctive and even at that when you're downtown at that time you nearly everything every single time you're down there someone will come up with a bunch of fellas and be like where do you live like what where's your street and then if you say to them you're living somewhere like a catholic area and they're like they could chase you like through the town or you have to let yeah. you either have to start yeah. f- fight them or leg it yeah. um but that's that has changed now like um big time um yeah. That has changed but at the same time i suppose the town was a common area like the town was highly militarized uh, in the early 90s as well mm-hmm. you know there was lo- a lot of cops and soldiers there and yeah. uh, like checkpoints at the at the entry entryways to the town and stuff they got there yeah yeah i know what i tell you know i could talk to you all day about yeah. belfast you know because i've such an, an interest in it you know and maybe we'll be able to do that for a coffee and um, but we'll move on because you've a big story after that as well but um you you were over in palestine What's it like over in Palestine? And will you explain the conflict, I suppose very briefly, a kind of a crash course for those that might know much about it? So how I ended up going to Palestine in the first place was because I always felt that we had a bit of a connection with Palestine, especially yeah. coming from West Belfast. That connection was always kind of highlighted and kind of nurtured in a way. So a few years ago, I had had the opportunity to, to go over myself and see, and I kind of wanted to go over and see how similar are things, how mm-hmm. different are things, just and go and speak to people, like what, what we were saying. And um, 2018 was the first time that I went over. So in a nutshell, like Pal- Israel uh, invaded Palestine in 1948. And then that's when the Nakba happened or the disaster. And there was a massive exodus of Palestinians who were fleeing from the Israeli army. And Israel took a, a large swath, swath of Palestine then. And there was another mass land grab in 1967 and another mass exodus of refugees who moved to different areas of Palestine who were squeezed into particular areas, uh, geographical locations in Palestine who fled out of the country as well. I mean, Palestine has got millions of refugees all over the world. Mm. And and now in the 1993 or something like that, there, there was the Oslo Accords, which was supposedly a peace agreement between Palestine and Israel. But... Um, in essence, what's, up, what's after happening is that's given Israel the sort of license to carry on with what they were doing. But because there's a, a quote, quotation marks peace process, it kind of like gives the optics that there's some kind of yeah. thing happening or, that, or there's some sort of peace there. But they've just carried mm-hmm. on with uh, with taking over Palestinian houses, taking more pieces of land and increasing uh, the you know, like the military occupation and the oppression that they're, they're inflicted upon the Palestinian people. Yeah. So, um, so Israel started off as a relatively small landmass, yeah. and over the years they've spread out and moved Palestinians off the land and kind of built their own settlements on it, the thing, and that continues. The thing that I think that's important to, to um, state or to kind of put up on the table is that Jewish people and Arab people have been living in the land of Palestine for thousands of years together. Mm. So uh, after the Second World War, uh, the like the Zionist movement became to the fore, which is more of a political and an economic movement. And it's it's the Zionist movement really that's 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 kind of uh, perpetuating the oppression of the Palestinians. Because you'd see I seen Jewish people protesting against what's going on in Palestine in New York City. Because not all Jewish people approve of what's going on 
in terms of Israel's occupation and the expandment down the settlements, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There's a perception that people might think that all Jews agree with what's going on here, they don't. It, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of differences between what ha- what's happening in Palestine now and what happened in Ireland, and there's a lot of similarities. One of the similarities is that what um, the mainstream media and the propaganda machine of Israel and America would like us to believe is that uh, Jews, that Muslims just really don't like Jews and, and the Jews need to go in and um, they're, fighting, they're fighting each other. And mm. It's a religious conflict, but it's not a religious conflict. It's the, the Zionist movement, which is a political movement, is the thing that is kind of keeping this whole project on the go. Yeah. Do you think do you think they, they use the religious um motive because they'll get they'll they'll be able to gain sides then because if they just say oh Israel is trying to take over the land of Palestine, the world is just gonna say, Oh, you can't you can't be doing that. But if they use the religion thing, like it's Muslims against Jews, yeah. you know, because they're let's be honest, like we all know what happened, Jews Jews you know, and, and there's a bit of sympathy, there is sympathy there, yeah. everybody's, you know, but I think the religion thing is being used an awful lot, yeah. do you know, to hide the real meaning of these conflicts. Of you know? course, I think so, and it's a, it's a really important point that you made about yeah. the Jewish people were persecuted big time um, and have fled from countries where they were being persecuted. Mm. One thing that I kind of get a sense of is that the you know like there's a lot of Americans that end up going to Palestine, uh, North Americans that go to Palestine and become settlers over there, and sometimes I kind of wonder is it because the fact that in North America North America is a relatively young country and it's in terms of the the white people who live in America they're come from all different countries from all over the world and, and mm. have populated that it's not like they haven't been there for thousands and thousands of years and sometimes I wonder if that um, that void of kind of really uh you know roots that are going back thousands of years has has have left them kind of vulnerable to um being saying right for jewish people in america israel is your ancestral home you need to go there because that's where jews are supposed to be from and then loads of americans end up going to Mm. uh israel and end up getting used serving in the army and used as kind of pawns in this Mm. in this political and economic and like colonial project that they have on the go with their ultimate the ultimate aim is to basically take over that whole land and just wipe Palestinians off the map. And so that, I think, that, that does kind of tie, in, tie into what you were saying there. Like. Mm. Mm. There's a joke Tommy Ternan has, it's probably small but inappropriate, yeah. like, but he says, uh, when, the, when the Israelis are before the UN, they say they put in for planning permission in the Old Testament. <laughs> 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 you know, but it is, and, and another part of that joke as well, he's saying, like, when Israel is before the UN security comes or anything like that, because they're so heavily backed by the Americans, mm. they don't give a shit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they, it looks like like if any other country was doing what the Israelis are doing in Palestine, the Americans would be in with fucking rockets and mm. the whole lot. But it, it seems like Israel can do what they want is and the, nothing happens. Is, is the reason for that, and I've noticed that myself, is the reason for that because of what happened uh, Back in World War Two, when I, you're, I don't know, is it because is there's it, so many influential people in it, America? Are actually is it that too? It could be, yeah. Because I thought, I, I actually, on a personal level, I thought the Israelis could do what they wanted yeah. more if they were being threatened by any nation or any any form of people that they could act in any way with arms that they they wanted to because of what happened in World War Two. That's that was what I actually thought myself. There's an element to it that I think that the Americans didn't want all of the Jewish immigrants to settle in America okay. and then it suited them to set them up in Israel and also it also suits America to have such a strong ally in the Middle East mm. and when you think about like the amount of e- economic exploitation that America do in the Middle East in terms of mm. uh, hoarding natural resources and taking oil and stuff like that from countries there then it suits them to have such a strong yeah. ally there so um, I mean that's a fairly deep rabbit hole you know, yeah, to go down and try yeah, and kind of like yeah. decipher all that there, but when you go over there, like the important thing is that what's happening to the Palestinian people over there is wrong yes. on every single level. Yeah. And that's the thing that you get a really tangible sense of whenever mm-hmm. you're over there. There's one side of the people who live in that land are being oppressed in every single way that you can imagine. And that's the thing to, to keep in mind. And I think that's probably why 
Irish people have such a strong connection with Palestinians on many levels is because uh, it's just so obvious mm. that that they're that they're being oppressed in that way. Mm. And I think then that that's why we got so much support for the, for the project that we started in Palestine is because people felt that we were going over there um, with you know, like really good intentions and that we were going to that people trusted us to go over and do do a job there that was going to be beneficial for people and then they got behind us to be able to eventually get that gym open like you were talking about earlier. Um, and how was the gym received over there? Well, whenever I was over there, um, as we were saying earlier, the important thing is when you're going to when you're going to Indian area that is uh, being oppressed uh, where the people are being oppressed are an area of disadvantage. The thing is to not go in like as if you're like a big messiah and you're, you've got all the answers or to start telling people yeah. what to do. It's the same and it's the same like when people go to uh, you know, like people who are studying uh, social issues in working class areas. Yeah. The thing is not you know, go in and just start telling everyone these are doing everything mm. wrong and you yeah. say, this is the way you need to be doing it and then leave again. Yeah. The thing is to go in and listen, and listen to what's yeah. happening and get people's stories and get to know people and make friends mm. and spend time there. So that's what I did in 2018 and um didn't go over with the intention of doing any kind of a project or being involved long term, but it, it made some good friends. And um, we were just talking one night, myself and one of, one of the fellows over there, Sala, and talking about the uh, life in the Ada refugee camp, which is where the gym is. And he mentioned that they had massive problems with high blood pressure and uh, massive uh, rates of diabetes, which those two things like are highly in- influenced by the lifestyle and the yeah. stress that you're under and uh in the refugee camp that comes in the form of the cramped space mm. like in the Ada refugee camp there's over five thousand people in a uh, three quarters of a square mile area surrounded by a wall there's six israeli watchtowers the israeli army attack the camp on a regular basis it's known as the most tear gas place in the world the soldiers the israeli soldiers come to that refugee camp to train new soldiers on how to use weapons okay. and just firing into the camp. Like there's videos on YouTube of the soldiers attacking the playground full of kids, five side pitch with people playing on it from up from a watchtower over over the top of it and firing the tear gas down. Like on the five side court there, which actually was uh, really well supported by the Celtic Supporters Club mm-hmm. to, to get it in there. Has, there's a very strong link between the it, Celtic supporters and the Palestinians as well. They have a metal mesh above the Five Side Court now because of those tear gas canisters burning the astroturf whenever mm-hmm. they land. So they put this metal thing in to stop that happening. And uh, So anyway, I just mentioned in passing that they ever think about opening a wee place where people could come and do a bit of training and stuff. And he said that it would be class to do it, but they didn't have the resources or the expertise or the funding to do it. So... Um, it was one of those things where I, say, I said straight away, sure, uh, I'll drop a plan here. And I came back down about half an hour later. I was like, what do you think about that there? And he's like, oh, I know, it's class. And then a couple of days later, I was thinking, what am I after getting myself into now? Because then <laughs> this the start. It was like, we were just sitting there, just chatting the way the kind of we were chatting now. Yeah. And then the next thing this project was after com- coming to life. And then that was the next couple of years of work all sorted. But I mean, very fortunate that we had such a... a class group of people who got involved in it in the in the immediate crew that were organizing all the fundraisers and uh the gofundme campaign and then that went out there and did it so yeah uh, that's kind of how it came about but it was well received it was well received because it wasn't about us going and doing something where it was like about us we were just helping them because yeah. like we just had this connection with them the way you know you would just help someone because they're your friends or something you yeah. know and it's, really it's about just um, doing what we can to so yeah. that they to to you know, like yeah. Yeah. you know it's, exactly how they're feeling because it's it's like a, the reason an addict in in recovery helps an addict that's struggling. Just the empathy, the like. same en- they have the same energy. They can understand how they're feeling, you know, because it, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not. Oh, not when well, you have with, similar but experiences, it's the same thing. It's hundred percent the, the same, same thing. thing. Like, see, see our gym in Cork, yeah. like, so it's exactly the same thing because the important thing is that people feel connected to each other. We all feel connected to each other, and that you feel connected to people that you don't even know. That so, so you, when you see that something's going wrong, that you mm-hmm. can you feel an empathy for them yeah. that you want to help them mm. and that's a thing that unfortunately because of the way that kind of modern society has gone it encourages people to be individuals more mm. and it, it wants people to be separate and the reason it wants people to be separate is that so that like 
you buy all of this shit that you think that you're that you told you you need and that you look after your own kind of little corner and you, you don't get together with other people because when people get together then they're more powerful like that's yeah. why the unions were so vilified in by margaret thatcher because she knew when people were coming together that they had the power to change things for the better but they wanted to privatize things and for things to get privatized people need to be separated from each other mm. and then that breeds this culture of individualism mm. and it's i mean it's the same thing in ireland like uh we're living in a society where like the profit is king and you know like it's all about the economy and yeah. you know, like kind of like that's why that's that's why the celtic tiger happened mm -hmm. look 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 how that worked out yeah. you know what i mean so our thing about um the Jim and cork is that we wanted to die wanted to test out this concept that like kind of business the function of a business shouldn't be about the profit it should be what it can offer the people that are coming to it the people who work there the, pe the, co the people who come and use the service and the community that's based in and that's the that's the basis on which the Jim and cork was built on and the gym in Palestine was just an extension of that. Mm -hmm. It's just about kind of like reaching out the hand of friendship to people. Mm -hmm. Like, and I just happened to be in Palestine because Something I was there and made that connection. So it's exactly the same thing mm -hmm. as what you're talking about. I think that like, it's one of the most important uh, sort of aspects of human nature that we need to encourage more mm -hmm. is like, that you see other people as your brothers and sisters and that you have compassion for each other. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuff and that and, I, and that, that goes across to even people that you don't agree with yeah. as well yeah. like you know well, yeah. you make a good point there about um in a society like a consumerist society like our own um where it's all about the individuals you know um when you're looking after your own side of the street there's no community mobilization mm -hmm. um and it, it made me think about a book that i come across when i was studying uh, rules for radicals by a chicago guy called saul alinsky but um he, he sets out a book for radicals, but it's all mm. about community activism and getting the community together. Because um, when you get people together, you can mobilise a movement, and mm. that's a dangerous thing for yeah. a government, do you know what I mean, that's trying to keep the status quo. Mm. Do you know, but I think definitely in this, in society today, um, it was, it's all about the individual, do you know what I mean? It's about you know, buying the next product and the next, and I can be a victim of that myself, yeah. do you know? It's, it's a culture that we're bred into and it's ingrained in us yeah. and as much as I can have a critical eye on it one day, I could be fucking buying something I don't need the next day, do you know? I think like I didn't mean to sound like I was saying, like I'm completely above all consumerism. I know, I know, I know. Like, like 100%, we're all subject to it. Yeah. The, yeah. the important thing is that you're aware of it as opposed to kind of like yeah. trying to let on that it doesn't affect you at all you can't resist it unless you want to go out and live in a log cabin out in the woods and they'd probably come out and fucking yeah. try and tax you in some way anyway move you on well when you look at the amount of commercials that are on television telling you have to be this way you have to be this way you have to get this to be this you know uh, it's all about the materialistic things that that we have and, and like we're, we're all growing up around them and it's like a battle and a fight to get there first and to get there at all you know whereas we're missing the real the real the realness of life which is just help your neighbor help your, mm. your, your your family members you know and help yourself you know your kids your wife uh, it just brings me back to something in my own life there recently I had to look at my own life and, and, and see what was really important you know um, what am I going to be worried about when I'm lying there dying on my bed like when I'm 85 or 90 or whatever I didn't make enough money mm. you know it's not that it's going to be do you know what I wish I spent more time with my kids yeah. you know or I wish I actually done that thing that I never done when I was 35 and, and it could have helped these this family or whatever you know it's we all want to live comfortably and have nice things and enjoy life you know but when I look at my life and and I look at it as in how poor my mental health was before how damaged I was from alcohol and drugs and I'm coming from that I have a bit of peace of mind today that I never had. And, you know, we always talk about a heaven and a hell. You know, a heaven and a hell are a, a, a place in your, your head. That's, that's me now speaking, my own experience. Um, and I have been to hell. And I can be in hell 
on any given day if I let this mind take over everything, you know. But I've also been to he heaven, you know, which is a place within this art, within this Cork City, within this this unit here. It's just a bit of peace of mind where you can just surrender into whatever way you're feeling, you know, at any given time and just not get into that madness, the self-critic or whatever, you know. And I think a lot of society today is caught up in so much of... of particularly with all the social media stuff, mm. you have to have this, you have to look this way, you have to have these teeth, you have to have this hair, Talk you have to have teeth. these boobs or ass or whatever it may be. We're forgetting about the realness of life, where it's just, none of these things matter. My wife kills me because of the way I, I, I look sometimes with my clothes. She dresses me basically half the time. Do you know, she has my clothes off when I come home from work. You know? You're actually after getting a few comments recently from really? people watching saying, <laughs> I noticed Timmy starting to wear shirts and put brill cream in his that's, hair. That's, <laughs> that's not my choice anyway. I'm but you know what, the people made. are liking it. But so well done, yeah, Nicole. Do can, I, can I just say yeah. one thing before you come yeah. in? Because I know you're eager to come in. Yeah. Do you know, like, it, it part of this, you know, so we get caught up in the consumer and the individuation of, you know, who we are in, yeah. in this society and having a, an awareness around that makes me kind of resentful of who I am at certain yeah. times, you know. But then when I think about I'm doing this podcast because we're trying to help people and bring people together, link people in with supports and kind of, mm -hmm. you know, be positive role models in the community. Then I was listening to um, a podcast last week and um, Eric Fromm, he's a, a philosopher from the Frankfurt School, which is very famous philosophy school in Germany and he was like um don't let don't use your personality he was on about love and happiness he was saying but don't use your personality as a, another commodity to sell to other people and then I was I was thinking to myself driving down here in the car when I was listening to that I was saying fuck it no I'm not doing something good you know and it's not all about the money it's not all about me I'm trying to help others and then I hear him saying you know are you prostituting your personality for commercial value and then i'm fucking thinking no nah, i'm actually i just this is another form of yeah. um boosting my own fucking you know mm. so it's very hard it's very hard to get away from it yeah but like i've been listening to the podcast like over the last while and it's class what you're doing because you're, you're bringing people together and we're having this conversation now and you've had other unreal conversations that might not necessarily ha know like have happened or it might have just been if it was in the mainstream media it might just be a two minute interview on the radio yeah. somewhere and you are giving people the opportunity to come and speak and then giving other people the opportunity to listen to it and like get different perspectives and you know i've also like there's been a good few guests on the show that have that are from working class areas and that have come up through like hard times and see the thing about consumerism I, mean, I felt this as well when we were kids like we were felt like we had to have the best gear like we could have been skint and been mm -hmm. spending all of our money on a pair of Nike Max and then be skint again but yeah. we look running around class runners and same here you know, like, <laughs> you know, like exactly like but in a way that comes from the fact that people who grew up in working class areas are made to feel like shit because of like the way that the opportunities are much less in, in a lot of areas that um, people have less job opportunities, less employment opportunities. There's way more addiction issues in working class areas. Mm. And like you want to do something to make yourself feel mm. good. And then the consumerism comes in that kind of gives you that kind of opportunity, mm. even though it's not like giving you a real sense of self-worth because like Timmy I've also heard you talking about your meditation a lot yeah. like yeah, yeah. and that connection with yourself and in my opinion anyway like that's what gives you a true sense of self-worth mm -hmm. if, if if you can kind of build that kind of a routine or yeah. a habit and something like I've been working on it's not like I haven't mastered it yet but I'll just keep trying doing it to, to, to do it mm -hmm. you know and and I think that like that's an important thing to like that's an important conversation mm -hmm. to have and yeah. it's not a conversation that that happens often enough really you know like among especially amongst amongst yeah. young men yeah it's yeah. It, it like just bringing you back to meditation there and your own experience with just trying to master it and overcome it um like i try to explain this to a lot of people about meditation like when they're trying to do it and they can't sit still and whatever it's it's just it's just like brushing your teeth you have to make sure it's you have to consistently do it like your your ego your physical sense ego you're you're not want you're not going to want to get out of bed because you're tired and you're going to make up all these different excuses ah oh, you don't you do tonight instead don't don't bother you know you, you'll be fine you know 
But that's, you, if you get up out of the bed, right, and you don't listen to that mind telling you to stay in bed, you're overcoming, you're overcoming yourself, you're overcoming the ego, you are overcoming that voice within telling you not to do it, you know, and you're getting stronger, and it'll get easier for you to meditate, you know, and, and I'm speaking this now through my own experience, but <clears throat> if I don't meditate for a few, uh, f- a few days, that voice comes back into my head. Don't bother. You can do it tonight. Or do you know what? Tonight will come then. Don't bother. you do it tomorrow, you know? Like when you had Tig on, he was saying that he meditated every day. He's been meditating every day yeah. for the last four or five years, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 yeah. minutes yeah. in the evening. That's unreal. He's yeah. a gas man, Tig. Yeah. He did a video on uh, Twitter today on, on his social medias. Mm-hmm. Um, he explains the... Uh, did you ever see his videos? He's on social media, yeah, but um, he had this video. He, like he's on his own. Obviously, he's in lockdown. Do you know what I mean? So he don't, he only makes videos of him. Do you know? So he there's one video and they're trying to explain Brexit, Ron. Is it? Uh, Brexit, Scotland trying to leave the UK and holds Europe wants Scotland, but the UK don't want Europe. But, and it's just a what we. But it's in the context of flat. Someone mates. sent me this today, oh, <laughs> and I didn't know it was him. Yeah, that's the yeah. He's fucking hilarious. Yeah, he's though, mad. He's mad. <laughs> Literally, oh, it was, I watched it when it was coming in here. Yeah, it's hilarious. He's my joke. Yeah, he's the most easy. Do you know that like, he just has this energy, just real essence, like just. Oh, he's just pure chill out as well. Like he's very yeah. easy to have a chat. He's with. a Republican man as well, yeah. and he's interested in Palestine. He's yeah. very um, political on his social media, yeah. um, and he's a nice fella. High tech. <laughs> <laughs> You can pay me later. Yeah. <laughs> but see, just to bring it back to, to the kind of mindfulness and meditation that, yeah. that, that we're talking about, like, this is, the, it's a really difficult time now. Like, a lot of people are going through mm. uh, fucking hell now, yeah. like, really, like, and I've seen something, again, on social media earlier on today, but, like, we're not all in the same boat, but we're all in the same storm. Mm. Some people are in luxury yachts and some people are on curricks and other people are just floating along on a piece of wood. Mm. Like, um, I think that... F- like we lost our mum to suicide at the end of last year Sorry. and that Sorry part for your loss. everything in the perspective mm. and like especially in terms of like the, the meditation mm. and mindfulness and everything out there because you see when you're you're going about your daily life it can seem like it's not that important to do it but then this shit hits the fan and then you realize like the value of mm. uh, the value that you've done it in the past yeah. or the value of doing it now like that's why i say to you know, people in um you know, people in early recovery or people, yeah, people in early recovery, this is the example I give. People that give up the drinking drugs and kind of come out of the mental health issues for a period of time, do you know, at the start. Um, and they think that that's it, do you know. And they might be in a great place, so they don't see the value in meditation. They don't see the value in counselling, psychotherapy, 12 steps or whatever, do you know. Because I'm grand now, I don't need to do that. But, you know, even though I was grand for the first few years in recovery, I still did all the this, this psychotherapy. Mm. I did the 12 steps and all that. Because, you know, when times do get bad, you have to have that shit in the bank to help you. And the people that tend to relapse in general mm. are the people that don't, that neglect all that other stuff. They don't do the meditation, they don't do the 12 steps, the therapy, you know, when yeah. they were in a good place. Because inevitably, you come up, you'll have a, a tragic event, you'll have a job loss or so, a fucking pandemic. Um, and you won't be able to fucking mm-hmm. you won't you won't be able to cope with because you haven't got all that in the bank. And I think that's kind of what you're touching on there. Like whenever the news came through that that this had happened, one of my really best friends, Shiva, was just happened to be in my house. She literally just got there a couple of sec- about thirty seconds before the news came through, and I was like, I remember just sitting in my bed going to her like, "What are we going to do next? Like, how are we going to get through this now? Like, what's like, what are we going to do? Like, literally, this is the immediately like." And she was just like just take it one minute at a time like you know this is the time to kind of cash in on all the meditation and stuff the, mm. the, the work that you've been doing so um kind of that's that's what we've been doing like just kind of taking it one minute at a time which i think is like good kind of advice for anybody yeah, really is you just kind of take it one teensy little thing at a time i just want to mention this and i think it's very important if anyone is struggling and i think it's definitely one of the best books that was ever wrote it's the power of nobody eckhart tolle right it's a free book you can get it on YouTube. It's free, completely free for anybody to listen to. And he just explains the importance of the present moment of now and overcoming and surrendering into your own shit. And I'll say shit now because I mean your trauma, the stuff you fear, shameful of, guilty of, 
It's just about feeling it. And he just says it very easily. He just says, if you fight against the weather, what good is it? You know, you're just going to make it worse. You just feel it. Whatever is going on for you, just surrender into it and feel it. Because if you fight against it, you're going against everything in life. You're going against the, the life itself, the law of life. It's just feel it. No matter how bad it feels, and I know how bad stuff feels, because I've been there, you know, I, I, I really have. Um, and at times I do get caught up in my head, but the times that I surrender into it and I feel whatever is there, and I release that energy that's trapped within me because of whatever situation it's there from, our, our experience, it's like I get more energy to create nice things in my life and I overcome something. I never know what it is that I'm after overcoming now, where the feelings after coming from, because a lot of my shit I can't remember, you know, but it actually happens, you know, it's it's just listen to stuff and listen to stuff like that frequently, like the power of now and other stuff like that, and your life will change. It's funny also that whenever you're feeling like shit, that can be the hardest time to start meditating or start reading stuff, you know what I mean? Like, so it's good to kind of try and get yourself involved in some of that stuff when you're feeling good but also like talking about meditation if you've practiced it or you've learned a little bit about it then that's one thing but uh the other thing is if it's completely alien to you as well like it's hard to get it mm-hmm. the way you're talking about doing it regularly so it's not mm-hmm. like you know you can be really hard like i can be hard on myself sometimes about mm-hmm. doing, like if i missed it i'll be beating myself up but you know like, it's good to just like try it and if it do you know like if it's not working out that particular day you just come back to it the next day yeah. or whatever and um, the other thing that I was only just thinking about this or yesterday I was talking to uh, my brother Carver about it earlier before I left Belfast. Um, it's one thing to read books and that's a class book. I've read that book a couple mm-hmm. of times and some more of his videos I've watched and his books and stuff. But um, it's learning about meditation is one thing and doing meditation different. is a little bit of a different thing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes accumulating that kind of uh, knowledge can nearly be a dangerous thing if you just keep accumulating it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it's it, it's it can be way better someone who's never read any books and just yeah. does a wee bit of meditation every now and again mm-hmm. and is able to kind of center themselves and bring yeah, themselves. They're not too analytical and then like you're just fucking doing it, you know? Yeah. But I, can I ask uh, about your mum? And if you want to go there, if you don't have to, um, like there's no good time to lose your mother, but during the pandemic is obviously worse because you can you couldn't have a traditional funeral. Or how, how did that work out? Well, we were fortunate enough that we had a bit of flexibility to have people up to the house okay. at the time that it happened so um it's funny enough because i was actually thinking about this whenever you were doing the mm. podcast with tag yeah. uh about the f- when he was saying about he had the, his tour and stuff organized and that it got cancelled because yeah. of covid and we're talking you I think you asked him about the arts getting hit yeah uh been it getting like artists being hit yeah. very, very badly mm. because of the pandemic and stuff like that there but one thing that was really powerful during the time of like but from the very minute that we got to Belfast was that um our friends came from here and there and came up to Belfast some of our friends are from Belfast as well were singing for us were having sing songs they were playing music for us and we really kind of like re- relied on that support for that's kind of a little support network mm. so we were fortunate to be able to have people up and um stuff like that but yeah. It just must be an incredibly difficult time for people who aren't able to yeah. do that. I don't mm-hmm. even know what um, we would be like now. Myself and brothers, if we hadn't had that opportunity. But I suppose, in a way, like it does go back to kind of what we're talking about—the meditation and it sometimes being hard to start something like that when you're feeling really low or yeah. down and or going through a, a, a tough period. I think that um, f- the the important thing is that when you're feeling down that you reach out to someone you know like yeah. if people are going through a bereavement like that and they haven't had the opportunity to have a, a, to have a proper wake yeah. or a get together or having like an extended kind of support network or whatever during that whole mm-hmm. period the important thing is that we're there for each other or that you, you can reach out to somebody even if it's not everyone who you would like to have there but to someone that you can reach out to and speak yeah. to yeah no mm-hmm. I'm, I'm actually glad that you were able to have that that get together for your mother's funeral you know because when I look at you know, people burying people mm-hmm. in this day and age, you know, it yeah. just adds to the tragedy of not having your close family friends around you and 
Do you know, so there's at least there's some solace in that, you know. The other thing is like that the cost to people's mental health and the amount of people that we've lost to suicide and around the world that have taken their own lives because of COVID, yeah. mm. uh, like it's gonna it's gonna be a big cost. Do you, the the co- do you think the, the pandemic was um, a contributing factor to your mothers? A hundred percent. Like y- you see, when you take pe- people, like people are isolated. Mm. All, all, all over the country and are missing out on social opportunities or, or like um not maybe not working not seeing people as much and yeah. all those things just like it kind of kind of like like do you know was it was it something that you could have ever seen happening or was it just a really out of the blue thing because like um i my own mother committed suicide as well when myself when the three of us were in prison um no we we couldn't even go to the funeral at the time we weren't left out of prison to go to the funeral one of us was left out they left two of us in dublin um um and i know what it's it's like to lose a parent like that the suicide but we grew up um watching our mother uh trying to commit suicide and from different in different ways you know through drug overdoses and um, and uh throwing herself in the river and different things like that you know, does did that did that ever happen to you? Was was that something you foreseen, or was it just things got to her? You see, in hindsight, and I'm sure that anybody who's lost uh, a friend or loved one to suicide will probably be able to re- relate to this. But like, there's so many questions about going yeah. back over time and thinking, yeah. would that was that the time that we could have done something, or if we had it done this, would this would it have been different, and so on and so forth, and um. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know really. You know, yeah. um, like it's a really, it's a really. I didn't mean to put you in this. No, no, uh, like it, like it's a tough personally, question. kind of like how I kind of like I'm, I'm mm. very grateful that to have my two brothers mm. and that that, that we two that, brothers that, as well <laughs> that we're going through it together <laughs> and yeah. um, yeah, I think that like I don't know. <laughs> just yeah. just that it just, just happens. So like, many questions yeah. ar- arise, and like yeah. the the thing that. A couple of things that kind of gives me a bit of solace or a bit of strength to get through it is that you see before something like this happens like if you try to imagine it mm-hmm. it's very hard to imagine that you'd be able to survive it you just yeah. think that you would just i don't know you know yeah. you're thinking yeah. maybe you would just keel over or something or you just yeah. wouldn't you'd fall to pieces but we're still here and we've been able to get through it with yeah. the support of each other and the support of the community community around mm-hmm. us and our friends mm-hmm. and other family members and the other thing is that like I, whatever burden that our mom was carrying with her has been released yeah. now, yeah. now like and i suppose that gives a bit of comfort now in hindsight but it doesn't take away the the questions about like you know like you see mental health and like suicide it's just obviously it's, it's a permanent thing but mm. it's it's not like our mom was completely physically healthy but a lot of the time it's a lack of hope Mm. that that makes people do something like yeah. that you know so anything that we all can do with each That's, other to other yeah. people to, to kind of help give a bit of hope or a bit of like just it, yeah. it can be something just as small a phone yeah. call yeah. reaching out smiling at someone spending a bit of time with someone or whatever That's why I was so angry recently when um, it was leaked to the mirror like, that we were going in for another nine week lockdown before it was actually fucking mm. announced by the government you know what I mean and if you're a woman at home or yeah. a man or anybody and you're already in isolation right for the last fucking 150 days or something we're in level five yeah. and they announce another nine weeks of it do you know there's no end in sight every time there's a deadline we come up to a deadline we're just going to be released we can call to our families yeah. go to the gym yeah. and have these go outside 5k then it's leaked in fucking nine and weeks long th- but there's people actually dying because of this because yeah. there's no hope every time there's a bit of hope this whipped from underneath them and the lockdown is extended and you know it's then it's the six news which becomes this many deaths this many cases lockdown is extended and people just fucking they just seem to give up you know? and like I don't, I don't understand why we didn't just close the you know people flying in and stop people from flying in mm. to the country for a while and what, 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 how does a lockdown work if you don't close the borders actually and you know on this point it, vaccination and that only works if we all get fucking vaccinated there was an israeli doctor on clear live the other night right 
a video link now. She was running about fucking the Israelis are like the, the pinnacle of the vaccination system in the world. You know what I mean? They have so many millions vaccinated, right? But they have a lot of Palestinians living amongst them that they've not given the vaccine to. Yeah, so they're just kind of leaving them. And your man turned around, fair play to her, an Irish woman that was on Claire Bourne, turned around and says, um, how can we not vaccinate the Palestinians? You're living right next to them, you know? Mm. And she just got all stuttered and got all flustered and hummed and hawed, but didn't actually answer the question, you know? There's no logical reason to it. It's just because the fucking Palestinians let them die, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But they'll end up killing their own. You know, it's like biting off your nose to spite your face yeah. type of thing. And I seen something on the news today I can't get it exactly right, like, so if anyone wants to check it out, just to get the fact right, but I've seen something that Israel were thinking about uh, giving their spare vaccines out to other countries, whatever, which it just kind of, like... Yeah, uh, it's it fucking mad, isn't it? point you're making, like... But there was something then the other day, um, we're in level 5 for 160-odd days, another yeah. nine weeks on the horizon, right, and um, we're all doing our part and whatever, you know? Um, there's a Brazilian variant, right, that we know was in Brazil, and we had 1,500 Brazilians come into Ireland there in the last couple of weeks. What, what's the point in a level five? Mm. Right? Are they not, are, are, are they not, did they actually have to go to a vote to, to pass the two-week uh, mandatory hotel stay for people coming in? Or is that even passed yet? No, the Brazilians just come in here, go through Cork Airport and Dublin Airport, that's and it. that's it. They brought it, because we have that Brazilian variant in Ireland now. Of course we do. Fifteen hundred Brazilians came in. Do you know what I mean with Jesus, it? Yeah. Do you know, but what's the point in having a level five if you're not yeah. going to close the borders and stuff? Do you know, and close the ports, and yeah. it doesn't make but any sense. Before I left, this is this just going back to how people are feeling there. Before I left, it's my daughter's birthday today. She's fourteen. Happy birthday, Georgia! Happy birthday! And um, before I left, I called up the room to her and I says, I says uh, "Do you want to come with me?" And she started crying. And. She's been locked in the house since before Christmas. The child hasn't seen a friend or anything like, and she's picking up little habits of staying up too late in, in the night, you know, just watching stuff out of boredom, getting up late, you know, and it's affecting, it's affecting the different areas of her life. Like, with me being a parent then, um, and just thinking, oh, she's gonna lack in education, I'm forgetting about her actual mental health. Mm. You know, we're actually forgetting about kids' need to socially interact with other kids to be at the same level. If they're wrong, she's wrong me. Mm. <laughs> what she'll go mad because, <laughs> do you know? But like the faster we get these schools back up and then kids can go back and play and just talk mm. and be kids and be teenagers and be whatever, better for for yeah. society because there's a whole, there's a whole two years nearly you now at this stage where kids have been in and out of school, like, you know, um, it's def there's definitely going to be something, a repercussion down the road that we can't see, you know, but we're going to look back and say, oh, that's because it'll, you know. The, or, when you think pandemic. about, like, adolescents like that, 14-year-olds, and they're in a, a stage in their psychosocial development where all they want to be around is their peers of their own age. They don't want to be around their their parents, mm. you know what I mean? It's all about the peers. And when you think of three, four, five-year-olds, like the, the crucial stages of development, yeah. you know what I mean? Early development. There's children now that um, they don't know how to hold a pencil, they can't write, be, they're five and six years of age now because they've missed the last year or so of school, you know? Um, my friend, he lives down in Tralee. He has a three-year-old son. The only child in the house, the child hasn't been playing with another child for the last 12 months. Yeah, I have a, I have a friend and their their youngest is nearly two and sure he is basically essentially like a spent his, mm, since yeah. he's been able to walk, he's been inside the house because pretty much like he hasn't been able to go outside yeah. and Isn't meet other so kids and stuff like that. Like, like, like I was talking to a, a family friend of ours uh, who's in the Azadis anyway and uh, he was saying, you're like, we had the Second World War. He's like, this is the Second World War of this generation, and it's going to be something that we're going to have to like kind of work together yeah. to get through in a way, like mm. with the, with the toll that's going to have on people afterwards. Mm. Yeah, but look, please God, from a personal perspective, yeah. I can't wait to open the fucking gyms. Do you know what I mean? And just I give us that what? release because I've so much fucking energy. That stop could... the politics and stop every other bit of shit that's going on with all these different vaccines and stuff, and just. Just distribute them and just give them to people that, people that need them and want them. And just let's get back 
yeah. some bit of normality where we can allow people to get out, mingle, um, and just enjoy a little bit of life. Go to the beach, yeah. you know, just go to a restaurant. Like, and yeah. like on a global level, the, the pandemic really yeah. has highlighted kind of like any economic inequalities yeah. from between in between countries, but also with, within countries as well. Like, and I think that, like, we're clearly living in a time again, not not to go back to this here, but mm-hmm. like in a time where in this kind of capitalist system where the profit is the king and mm-hmm. like the vaccines are being so like, why aren't the vaccines free? Yeah. And like, I'm not yeah. I'm not an economist or a, po- a politician, yeah. or like, but it seems to me that like if someone's after making a vaccine that can cure a virus that's killing millions of people all over the world, why don't they just make it and give, give it to everyone? We focus. Just give it all. Like, is that is that are we just being too simple yeah, or something? You know? <laughs> we, we have Pfizer, <laughs> Pfizer down in the skiddy. Mm. We're creating the fucking vaccine. And why the fuck do we have to, you know, it's, a lot of it doesn't make sense. Like, it's yeah. just fucking, it's very frustrating when you get into it. But look, I'd want to go down on a tangent around COVID because we're yeah. probably burning up a lot of battery time there. It's the first time we've actually spoke about it since the podcast started. I know, but you know why you it's know? actually getting depressing at it, the moment. It is. You know, uh, the, the other nine weeks of it, like, it's uh, fucking, it's a bollocks, like. Yeah. So all it I want to do is go back to the gym, as I said, yeah. on a personal, and a, you know. I just want to go back to the fucking gym. My gym is a big part mm-hmm. of my recovery, do you know what I mean? And you never factor in the fact yeah. that we could hit a pandemic, do you know? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd love to just, just, we do a bit of walking as well. Like, and I just want to fucking, like, I was injured all the long with my, my leg. All I want to do now is just see a different environment and yeah. just go to carry it and just go walking, go yeah. to the beach, just do something different, you know? What's what's it been like for you? Isn't it like, say, after, say, coming through, like, recovering from addiction and stuff like that there has mm-hmm. the pandemic impacted say it, your like mental yeah. health in that regard of there's course, a lot of people yeah. after relapsing yeah a lot of people because they're bored they can't go to work and one of the most important things for someone that's in early recovery is to not be bored yeah you know yourself busy like and if they're out of work and they're not getting meetings and they're caught up in their head they're going to look at a way out and the way out is a drug and it's a drink you know um, there's a lot of people relapsing, a lot of people fucking taking their own lives over over everything because but, of yeah. the fear of going back using and stuff like but that. Even, as well. even for myself, like um, not not having the gym was mm. the big thing for me because I go to the gym four or five days of the week for the last since I grew up to drink and drugs, you know. And when the gyms was closed, then it was like you know novelty, play the Xbox, eat some cakes, mm. biscuits, yeah. working from home. Mm. This is grand, you know what I mean. Lockdown yeah. two, then it was like, yeah, this is actually fucking shit. Lockdown three is, it's a nightmare. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And it's like, I'm living in a one bedroom apartment as well, right? Yeah. And my wife is a teacher. She's teaching from home, so I've nowhere to fucking go. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I've nowhere yeah. to go. We're in a one bed. Uh, we're getting fucking sick of each other at yeah. times, you know. And yeah. just there's no outlet. You know, you can't yeah. you can't call it anybody. You know, you haven't got that usual outlet. So then I suppose I did mm-hmm. start. Um, started doing the meditating just trying to get off the xbox do a bit of reading listening to other podcasts but i just feel so privileged to have this podcast every week and we're allowed to do this because yeah. we have a big a big space we can do it socially distanced and under the guidelines of level five you're allowed to record and broadcast once there's no audience so the we, we took counsel with the local td he told us to drive on we got the space thanks to mm. a lovely lady and yeah. uh, i feel very blessed that i can come down here yeah. speak to interesting nice people every week and at least have that two hours mm. where my old al isn't fucking i'm not an eye no <laughs> like, i was just exactly the same during the first lockdown like i was doing the podcast every week on zoom like but it was still good to be able to connect with people yeah. i think if any, if the if the pandemic has has highlighted anything it's um and maybe something that uh you know, in modern times that we've kind of lost sight of in, in some respects is the importance of community and how important it is to feel connection with other people mm. and like feel a part of something. Mm. And now that that's kind of been stripped back to the very basics where we're more kind of separate from each other mm. in, in many ways that it does highlight the importance of, of being connected. I actually heard, I don't know, was it Russell Rand I heard talking about it a bit that the opposite of addiction is connection. Mm. So yeah. we were like, yeah. <laughs> Exactly, you're on the ball. Yeah, it's yeah. connection. It's, it's connecting, and social interaction is what recovery is all about. Yeah, it's about connecting with people that have had similar backgrounds to you, similar addictions, and being able to say, "Do you know what? 
I'm actually like these people. Yeah. There's, I'm, I'm not my own anymore. It's about connection. It's about yeah. feeling a part of something. Like like we all need that. Like everyone yeah. needs that. It's not just if you have if you're coming through uh, like a recovery process or whatever. Yeah. Everyone needs yeah. it to be to feel connected with with someone else or with ourselves as well. Yeah. Like I think that's the biggest thing yeah. from the meditation point of view is that you get connected with yourself yeah. first and foremost, yeah. and then you can start connecting with other people. Yeah. Do you want to plug your podcast, Rebel Matters? The Rebel Matters podcast has been on the go for uh, since 2017. So this is going to end it. a while. It's fourth year now. Yeah, like Vicky Langan came on board as a producer last year. I think around, uh, when was it? It might have been about uh, August or something last year. So we're doing an episode every two weeks. Yeah. And it's kind of similar. Mm-hmm. Like It's just a casual kind of chat, informal yeah. uh, conversation. Like The way that I think about the podcast is a good episode is one where... I just ended up having a chat with someone that I would have just had with him anyway, but we just recorded it. That's mm-hmm. exactly what we yeah. said about this as well. Because yeah. this came about because me and Timmy would sit down and have conversations. And then we were thinking like, fuck, you know what, if we actually just throw a camera up there and record it, it mm. could help a lot of people at home. Remember, we're talking about yeah. the things we do to maintain our recovery. Um, and that's kind of the same, same, ta- same concept, really. 100%. Yeah. yeah, I think the podcast format is good because like... You can do it. You can do it for as long as you want to. You know, like in terms, it doesn't have to be like in squeezing the yeah. twenty minutes. You can get whoever mm-hmm. you want on, and mm-hmm. you know, like I like the ones that are kind of unedited. You know, like there's yeah. really f- f- we, high we, we don't edit it. anything. No. So <laughs> no. all the burps and everything, everything else. Because, because it, no, in in a normal conversation, sometimes people lose their train of thought. They'll stutter. They'll fucking interrupt each other. That's just part of the conversation. We don't have, we don't all have to talk like RT news presenters with everything clean cut either. Do you know what I mean? The other thing about the podcast, which same as yourselves, is that it's been class to get the support from other people through Patreon. You're like because yeah. that just kind of gives you a bit of a boost and yeah, yeah. kind of creates it does kind of creates a bit of a connection. Like yeah. I feel like pretty well connected to the people who listen to the podcast and the supporters on on yeah. Patreon like because they're making it happen yeah. really like and they're kind of endorsing what we're doing mm-hmm. the same way that all your followers have been yeah, yeah. endorsing you and saying like you're doing something good there lads that's yeah. worthwhile yeah. keep doing it we'll support you and then yeah. that kind of to think to think that you could create something out of nothing yeah. right and people would like it so much that they'd give you money every month for it that's mm-hmm. it's a great feeling yeah. you know what I mean it's very satisfying and then for the people that don't but they send you in emails and comments and, and you know, they make themselves known. It's affected them this way or they like this episode or they like this guest, you know. It just makes it all worthwhile, you know what I mean? And as, as you know yourself, it's not an easy thing to do, you know. It looks lovely when it's done, you know, and it sounds great, like, but you have to, you know, get the guests, you have to come out, you have to give up your time. We're all working full time outside of all this too, you know, so, um, yeah. I think that with the pandemic as well, that I found myself being sort of attracted to the artists and our people who are doing podcasts and stuff who are kind of like just keeping it real it's, it's real like it's a real mm. chat like yeah. talking about real things in real life or mm. it's kind of not like just superficial glossy and highly produced yeah. because of the fact that we're going through this time where connecting with other people is so important yeah. it's like yeah. more important than ever before because of the fact that a lot of people are physically isolated that we're very lucky to like sometimes I'm like on my phone too much and I'm like fuck I need to stop going on my phone as, as much but like at the same time like, we're kind of lucky to have them to be able yeah. to, to do that I you know, know. Like, like, people, yeah. people listen to the podcast yeah. on their phones and listen to the, they'll be listening to this on their phones yeah. at the same and, time and like, there's a positive and a negative to everything yeah. really and and there's, there's people that feel very connected to me and Timmy that we've never met yeah. do you know what I mean but they, they know us well by now um, I've cried great. to some of the emails that people have said Sent us. I've actually cried to him because I could actually feel joy and sadness from him both at the same time because some somebody's changed their life from listening their, their recovery, but I can also feel their pain at the same time, and and I get a lot from from listening to yeah. people's stories. Like and you don't know what impact you're, you're having on someone. Mm-hmm. You may you may have said something earlier on in this chat here that someone might hear next year yeah. because this will still be on Spotify and it might have a positive impact yeah. on them. Yeah. And I think that, that that comes back to like that's something that I kind of like think about and I'm like you can't be perfect all the time. All you just do is just do your best. Yeah. You do your best. Be yourself. And exactly. Like do something that you like doing, like like the way mm-hmm. you're doing, and yeah. the way that I can like feel yeah. fortunate to be able to do as well is like do something that you enjoy doing. It's like it's like it's a privilege to be able to do something that you that you, that you enjoy doing, yeah. and then you're kind of doing it honestly, and yeah. it might have a positive impact on someone yeah. as a 
Like that's a nice yeah. side effect as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, you know what yeah. was a nice email as well we got there recently. Uh, do you know who watches the podcast? Christy Moore. No way. Yeah, yeah. he sent us an email yesterday. <laughs> Uh, that's the second time he's emailed us, you know. So that's amazing as well, yeah, you know. Fair play, yeah. fair play, Christy. If you're yeah. watching uh, on the ball, but yeah, well let's tell you the story about Christy yeah. Murray. About uh, 2011, I, when I was up in the Piercy actually as a friend of ours, um, Carol Lehan, who lived in Belfast, but he's from Coulee, you know, just outside Balvernie. And he rang me one day and he goes, uh, I want you and Carbra as my brother and Sean Og to come down to take part in this festival. I was like, what is it? He's like, oh, no, just come down, just come down. It's like, it's the first time it's happening. It's not going to happen for another seven years. And then I went down anyway, and it was called Fell in the Lake. There was seven elements to the festival, right? Uh, what was it? I'll try and run them off, but it was singing, dancing, music, storytelling, poetry. Um, well, there must have been another one. And the sport was the last one, and we were doing the sport part or whatever. And... Uh, I thought it was starting at sunrise and stopping at sunset, but it was actually starting at sunrise and going all the way on till late till sunset. And it was free in, nobody was getting paid for it, and uh, there was no drink at it. And there was all the different seven elements. Charlie Birdnall was there doing storytelling. Mm-hmm. Michael Mahurti was there. Wow. Doing story. I didn't all, didn't all night around Michael Mahurti. <laughs> going around getting him cups of tea all night. <laughs> and uh, he was he stayed up all night. And then uh, Pat Arreda, who was organizing the festival, looked, this is what we're going to do. At sunrise, I want you to go up this hill. The festival was in a wee field that had a river on the side of it. And he goes, you just go up the hill there, the other side of the river. I'll be on the stage with the orchestra and I'll wave this yellow flag. And uh, when I wave the flag, you just leg it down the hill. So it's me, Carver, Shannon, we helping, Anthony Lynch. And uh, I think Breeze Corky was there as well. Uh, and we ran down. And then by the time we got down to the field, there was like 300 people at the festival. We were gathered around in a big circle, uh, cheering. But you no, know, see, when we went up, I was like, Turned around and Christy Moore and Glenn Hansard were on the stage singing the old triangle <laughs> with an orchestra behind them. And uh, I, I was in my car at the car, but I was like, look at that there. Isn't this mad? Like we've been up all night, like no drink or anything. And the sun is coming up and he's going to wave this flag. We're going to run down. And the next thing he waved the flag and we're running down the hill. And all you hear is, and the boys from the Glens of Antrim are running down the hill. And we all <laughs> he was commentating on the whole thing. And into the middle of the group and we were all jostling and all. And then uh, it all kind of came to an end after that anyway. And I was standing at the car and uh, Christy Moore comes over and he goes, here, where's that Sean Oak fella? I want to have a, a word with him. <laughs> and then uh, next thing she was just there sitting having a chat and Christy was breaking into a couple of songs just after the sun was that were coming up. It was Cracker. That's unreal. That yeah. sounds like a fucking dream I'd have. Yeah, uh, that's it was. Like, so you know what it is? We were there. We drove. We were driving home back to the city. It was myself and Carbra and her friend Rachel who was playing in the orchestra. And I was driving and I was like, lads, I was like, I'm going to have to stop the car here because I'm knackered. I'm falling asleep. And we, the three of us fell asleep in the car on the side of the road, just somewhere outside of Mallow or somewhere. And woke up all three hours later, we woke up and we all thought it was a dream. No oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Just like, <laughs> just next time that festival is on, it was a show with that. I'll tell you now, it was on again in 2018. So the next one's going to be uh, 2025. It's every seven years. We might actually oh, do a live yeah. show on it or something. <laughs> yeah. We do, do, we definitely do something in here. But uh, we've our own ideas about having a recovery festival type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, non-alcoholic festival. Um, we've had a few guests and other musicians, comedians that would like to perform. Um, yeah. So we'll touch base with you. You should do it because mm. you see, I think that after uh, things, the lockdown and stuff, stuff starts lifting. It's going to be a big appetite it, for it. Well, there is, but it's going to be really difficult to have these massive festivals. See, like electric picnics and all those like big 10, 20,000 people coming Absolute. together. I think the the next thing's going to be running these small festivals where like people are just you know, like you probably end up talking to nearly everybody at the festival. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember? It's a great idea. Yeah. You should do it's it. It's a great, yeah. great idea though, isn't it? But um, definitely, I think you would enjoy it. And if you want to, if you want to come on board with us and do a live podcast, maybe, um, yeah, that'd, yeah. be great. that'd be great. Yeah. But look, we were after having a great conversation. I really yeah. enjoyed it. The start of it was a history lesson and I've learned a lot from you. I hope everybody else has learned a lot. Um, Me too. You're a lovely fella and I wish you nothing but the best condolences and your bereavement and yeah. best of luck with your gym going forward and the podcast. And uh, if you're looking for a couple of handsome guests, we sent Tim even though. Thanks, my lads. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, thanks again. Thanks, Timmy. Thanks, thanks Rowan and the decks. And thanks to everybody for watching the podcast and for all your lovely comments. And we see you all again next week. Thank you. Keep our lit. Slan, lads. <laughs>